introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Bill. Unfortunately, I think that a lot of the reason that the Republican Party has become as 
divisive and to the right as it is, is because of the influence of money in our drives politics today. Uh, when I took the position of, of Director of Security Regulation in 2002, uh, I, I thought I would do so just to do a couple years and then go back to private industry. And I realized in 2002, uh, within a month of my taking position, I got a call from uh, the New York District Attorney's Office asking if we would help them do an investigation of Tyco. And I said, sure, because most of the people, particularly Dennis Lazowski, who was the CEO at the time of Tyco, was from New Hampshire. And we issued a subpoena for records, and the company wouldn't honor the subpoena. So I went to the Attorney General's office, and a member of the Attorney General's office said to me, you know, we don't do that kind of stuff here. <laughs> and I'm just saying to myself, wow, that's different. But at the end of the year, we then had the second largest security settlement in the nation's history. It was $5 million, which now seems like chicken feed when you see the billions of dollars in terms of fraud that's coming out now. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, the relative numbers is because regulators, quite frankly, weren't doing their job the way they should have been. In part, what I learned in that eight years when I served as director is because a lot of regulators are afraid that if they go too far in regulation, they can lose their job. They may not be reappointed. Uh, unfortunately, particularly in the, in the federal level, a lot of people become uh, attorneys with the Securities Exchange Commission. They call it punching their ticket. They go in for two or three years and then go work for uh, a law firm and represent clients that they actually took uh, litigation against. Uh, but that's part of the problem. The other problem is Congress. And Congress doesn't always, and I know you understand this better than most, put the best interest of the country forward. In 2010, there was a study done by the International Monetary Fund, an uh, international organization. And they wanted to know what the root causes of the downturn in the American economy was in 2007-89. And the title of the paper was A Fistful of Dollars. And economists who wrote it, their conclusion was that if the United States, this is 2010, doesn't rein in the amount of lobbying influence in Washington, we will see another global hit to the economy. It's coming. And the reason they drew that conclusion is because $3 billion is spent annually in Washington today on lobbying by some 15,000 lobbyists. And probably 20% of that number is from the financial services industry. And lo and behold, they are going to Congress and saying, we don't want you to pass regulation. Let me give you an example. In the same study, they pointed out 31 attempts in legislation in the period 2002 to 2006 to rein in the credit and mortgage problems. I'm talking about predatory lending, no document loans, negative amortizing loans, all subprime debt, all the things you've heard about. But Congress didn't act. And neither did the Federal Reserve, which had power over the mortgage market. Now, if you look at the last decade, 2000 to 2010, here's some statistics. It was probably the most disruptive financially in our country's history besides the Great Depression. But between 2000 and 2002, the market the stock market went down three years in a row, wiped out a lot of value, and we ended up with a law called Sarbanes-Oxley, which was to say that we don't want to have Enrons and WorldComs and Global Crossing. These names probably sound familiar to you. So we all thought we had, we had basically solved the problem of how we're not going to go through that kind of downturn again. And then in 2006 and 7, we learned about Lehman Brothers. And then when the government decided to let Lehman Brothers go, we had to now backfill and recapitalize all these kind of banks, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, the list goes on. And now look at the economy today, where we are we're creating jobs, but not the kind of jobs that we need. We have real income of Americans today that's real, for real inflation adjusted, it's behind what it was seven years ago. The middle class is hollowed out, and really, if, to go back to the Roosevelt era, we are now seeing concentration of asset and power that is unprecedented in our country. And if you take even a long historical perspective, it really started in the 1980s, when we deregulated the savings and loans industry, and what did we get? A blow by that industry. Then we got uh, 
Bank of Commerce and, and uh, Loan out of Washington to engage, many banks engage in money laundering. Then we got the Congress repeal Glass-Steagall in 1999, which separated the bank, investment banks and commercial banks. And then we saw what happened in 2000 to 2002, and then the period we're still living in now. So that's the backdrop. And where we are today is this. We have Dodd-Frank. A legislation was passed in 2010. 900 pit paid the bill, half of it has been implemented. Now why is it only half? Part because it's very complicated. But the real reason it has been, has been enacted is because the lobbyists are back trying to water it down. In fact, last year, uh, several banks, led by Citibank, got to the House Financial Services Committee and the, leg and the House, they passed a bill to basically roll back many of the reforms that dealt with derivatives, credit default swaps, and what Dodd Frank said was that these kind of banks that deal in these kind of what what was called by uh, Warren Buffett instruments of financial destruction, that they now had access to the federal government to be bailed out. That after only a couple of years, the Congress is back trying to backfill. And where is the Congress today? Well, that same piece of legislation I just mentioned, a study was done of it. The people who sponsored that bill were 17 times more likely to get contributions from those big banks than people who didn't vote for it or co-sponsor it. That's where we are today. The banks that were involved in a lot of these activities are basically unregulated, and they were. These banks, I can tell you today, are bigger today than they were in 2007. 12 banks in this country account for 98.2% of the financial assets of this country and account for almost the entire GDP of the United States. The derivatives market, it's $720 trillion, so 20 25% larger today than it was back in 2008. Now those are statistics that tell a story. And it gets back to the influence of money and lobbyists and how they influence the people who run for office. I was mentioning that we have the New Hampshire Rebellion campaign going on in two marches. One was in January, uh, down from the notch to Nashville, and the other one was in the seacoast this summer. And what that's all about is to call attention that we really need to rein in this influence. Now, let me some more statistics. The last election, 2012, so an estimated some six billion dollars are spent in all of the presidential and federal elections. But it's also an estimated that about a billion dollars of that came from these 527 organizations, 501c3, you've heard all the you know, acronyms. What it means is to try and hide money. A lot of this money we don't even know, it's called dark money. We don't know who's, who, where the money's coming from, where it's, where it's going. In fact, it's been, it's been documented that only 64 individuals, 64 individuals, 2012 gave an average of four and a half million dollars. That was some one quarter trillion, billion, excuse me, one quarter billion dollars, and that equaled the same amount of money 1.5 million Americans contributed to the presidential candidates. Now that is scary. What it means is fewer and fewer people are controlling the amount of money that's going in to drive our political <coughs> dialogue, and it's been estimated that, that amount of money will be exceeded this year over $1 billion in a non-presidential year. And we're seeing it here in New Hampshire, particularly in the Senate election between Scott Brown and Jean Jean. So what can we do about it? One of which is there's been a move by many states to say to the Congress, we need to have an amendment to the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. Now, Citizens United, as you might know, was a Supreme Court decision, I think it was 5 to 4, 2010. And basically, throughout major portions of the King Feingold election reform in 2002. And what that said basically was that corporations weren't people, that we couldn't have unlimited monies going out from corporations and labor unions to campaigns, so called independent expenditures. And that was strong. So now we've seen the exponential increase in the amount of money that's being put into campaigns. Now, as I mentioned, 17 states have asked Congress to do this. New Hampshire has not. The, the legislature did, but this, the Republican Senate wouldn't do it. They wanted to study. They wanted to study. I mean, I don't know what else they wanted to study. 
Now, on the national level, to have a constitutional amendment, there's two ways to do it. Either the Congress does it, two-thirds of the House and the Senate send an amendment to the states, or the states can instruct the Congress to do it. The Democrats in the United States Senate, they want to do it, but they can't get the votes to the Republican United States Senate. So the likelihood of Congress and to be cynical about it, when they're part of the problem, as a group, are they going to solve it? Unlikely. So we as states have to say that enough is enough. And why it's important in this election, listen to people tonight, we need to have a Senate and a House that can be made in the 18th state. Because once that number becomes 22, 25, Congress will be nervous. Why will we be nervous? Because the Constitution said that there's a constitutional convention. And the last thing people in Washington want is a constitutional convention because then they don't get to control it. So if you think about all the amendments we've had in the United States Constitution, it's always been through one issue at a time. Whether it's a woman's right to vote, whether it's a changing uh, the, uh, succession of the presidency, we need to do that now. 75% of the United States citizens, Republican and Democrats, want to change the, election, the way we elect people today. They know it's a system out of control. And even a majority of Republicans want to make a change. This is not a partisan issue. Our democracy is that under threat. So let me bring you back to, uh, not to skip you, but if you go back in the last, at least since the Vietnam War, the banks have gotten bigger, they've gotten more influential in our economy, and even went through the huge blow up in 2008 they're bigger today than they were then. Why am I telling you that? Because if we don't rein it in, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when we have another major blow up. Because this system cannot control itself. Um, outside of Citizens United, what can we do? Well, we need to bring in the lobbyists. Lobbyists today, they bundle money for candidates. They uh, contribute money to candidates. We have these entities in, in, in the nation that don't disclose. They're all where the money's coming from, where it's going. Again, the United States Senate has tried to rein it in under the Disclose Act. Three times it hasn't been able to pass. Uh, here's one for you. 50% of all United States Senators, when they lose or choose not to run for re-election, they become lobbyists. And they only have a two-year cooling off period. And there are those, like Scott Brown, who leave in 2012 and then become a lobbyist right away for one of the biggest law firms representing the financial service industry. And he was the number one candidate for financial contributions. They, call, they don't call themselves lobbyists, they call themselves advisors, strategic advisors. It's another way of getting around the rules. So why not say, when you become, when you leave Congress, whatever you call yourself, you're not allowed to go back and lobby under any circumstance for at least five years, maybe ever. Because this system not only has revolving doors from, from the Congress to K Street, believe it or not, there are people who go from corporations and become appointed into the executive branch, who actually, in some instances, are awarded a bonus based on how high they become in the, in, in the government. Now, if that isn't a system that needs to be reformed, and the reason a lot of these things seem logical is because when you get down to Washington and they argue these things between themselves, they come up with all these reasons not to pass what the, the citizens know we need. So it's going to take the kind of grassroots effort that uh, the New Hampshire Rebellion represents. And the reason we're doing it is because we're the first nation primary. We want to make sure every presidential candidate understands that we really are tired of it and we want to change. Um, so that's kind of my overview of the subject. I know I've left you with some negative news, but the positive thing is we can do it. And when you go back to every major instance in American history where we've become controlled by elites, we have made a difference. I think this generation can do that. So I am hopeful that we've got to all take responsibility for putting pressure on the system because Washington will not be able to change itself. Um, now, if you want, I can tell a little bit about my book, and I'll do it in the context of New Hampshire. This is the message I want to give you. We're not that different. We're just at a very small level. There's some 300 lobbyists in Concord today. It costs $150,000, $100,000 to run tonight for the state site. Why? Because so much money is coming in from lobbyists who really want to be, who want to be involved. The Senate is one of the smallest, and it's the smallest in the country. That's where the power is in terms of the lobbyists want to influence. 
I can tell you when I was a regulator, there were several uh, instances where I saw um, financial products being sold in our state that have absolutely no regulation. No regulation. In part, that's what caused financial resource and mortgage company. And every time I went to uh, the legislature to try and overcome it, the lobbies would show up and they would, they would help kill it. So it's a lot different. It's a small magnitude, but it's there in New Hampshire. And there was an entity called the, uh, I believe, the Public Policy Institute, and they ran New Hampshire a D, D in this country for transparency, for disclosure in executive offices, even reporting of campaign expenditures. We need to do better in New Hampshire, and we can. And as we've seen in our election laws, unfortunately, corporations and uh, PACs can give unlimited money to political uh, PACs. Now, we've got to change that. We've got to make sure that we really have election laws represented in this state, in my opinion, what's in the best interest of everybody, Democrats and Republicans alike. Uh, so we have work to do here, too. And, and we did pass for the first time in a long time, the Disclosure Act is past session. It came from the Senate. And the good news is that this bill, the governor signed, says that any outside group that comes to our state and spends money, they have to disclose where they're spending the money. The bad news is that they couldn't get that through the legislature if they actually said who's giving the money. And the bad news is again that some of the groups that we want to stop influencing our politics in the state that they actually uh, get a message that we need to rein this in. They're saying they may take this to court. Um, so our election laws here do need uh, work, and, and I think um, hopefully with some of the people get elected from this, from this area, and, and Democrats will be able to keep the House and the Senate, and we can get that done. So uh, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to answer any.
Unfortunately, it doesn't win on that side. If he had, I would picture some kind of situation where the, the debate, the conversation at this point between Rubens and Shaheen might have gone something like, uh, what do you, and you know, his question, his question to Shaheen might have been, what do you plan to do about corruption in politics? What are your states? What are your, how are you, what, how are you going to act when you get elected? And I, I think that is a really important question. I think it's a question that we should be asking as independents, Republicans, Democrats, or whatever, of all of our candidates from whatever strike, what are you planning to do, you heard this before, about corruption in politics? And, uh, and, I, and it's important that we hear that. So one of the things that disturbs me right now is that our main candidate on the Democratic side, Gene Shaheen, is not saying anything about corruption in politics. She has no platform. She has made a few statements, but they're way in the past, like back in 2012. Um, you know, I think if this group was interested in what you're talking about, which we all should be, to actually get our government back so it was working for us, should be asking that very specific question of the person that we're going to support. <coughs> uh, we want you to, uh, to uh, work hard create campaign finance reform for this country, for our system, so that it will work. So I'd like to hear, I'd like to talk to Sure. Uh, first of all, um, Senator Shaheen, when this campaign started, she did ask Senator Brown to take what's called the People's Pledge, which was when he ran against it was Warren in 2012, they both agreed that if these monies were you, I, I, I'll give you the exact, but that the monies, that the candidates would match the money would go to the charity of their choice. And Scott Brown wouldn't do that. Jean uh, Jean has supported the Disclosed Act. I believe she is in favor of amending the Constitution to or return to United. And I think for another way of looking at it, the problem with unilaterally disarming, if you will, if you say I'm only going to take a hundred dollars or you're not going to win. And, and part of the message by Professor Lesson is uh, we will support candidates who are part of the system as long as they realize that they're going to fight to overturn, overturn the system. Because otherwise, we will always be left behind. We can't be unilateral this on. But let me give you an example. In 2012, in the governor's election, I think so. We're not sure how much money to spend in New Hampshire. They estimate 24 million. It's an estimate over 20 million of that was from these independent expenditure groups. And nationwide, these independent expenditure groups are outspending the monies that candidates can raise. So what does that mean? It means it's, it's a vicious circle. More money is raised in the back end from these groups, and it causes global candidates to try and spend all their time raising money. It's been estimated that 50% of a congressperson's time is spent fundraising. That's the system we operate in today. And so if you want to stay in office, you can spend a lot of time making the calls that we all get. And how about a law that says that if you're in Congress, that the hours that you're a congressperson, you don't fundraise. Right? There are little steps that can be taken to change the system, but the system is so out of control, it's hard for any one individual to take on the battle all by him or herself. But to her credit, I've heard Senator Shaheen talk about wanting to make a change. I love the view that all politics are local. So I'd like your uh, advice on a very local issue. We are represented by a state, uh, a New Hampshire Senator, Senator Shaheen, uh, Senator Forrester, excuse me, uh, who voted to effectively kill the efforts to pass on the recommendations, in most cases unanimous recommendations, of 55 of the constituent patents to uh, seek to try to overturn Citizens United. Now that recommendation was passed on to both of our, our senators and our United States representatives, 
and to all of our local uh, officials, including Senator Marston, who proclaimed herself in my town, in front of me, as very strongly in favor of campaign finance reform, something she could really get her teeth into. We're now faced with her running, and she's a formidable candidate for a whole variety of reasons. We can't attack the issue from a global perspective. We have to direct our attention to her in this issue in the New Hampshire system. So what's your advice as to how to go about doing that? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Well, the only thing I can tell you is it's going to take letters to the editor. It's going to take uh, forums. Uh, because in this case, now, other people in this room can speak this issue more uh, adore than I can, but I will tell you this. The Senate Republicans took the position that they weren't going to pass any kind of uh, instruction to Congress. And I think part of it was because they were trying to have it both ways. To come to you know the town to say, I'm in favor of campaign finance reform, but they are very much the beneficiary on a relative basis to the way the system is now. So they say, well, you know what, we're gonna study. Or we won't, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna take a, a pass on anything, because we really have the people's business to do here. It's all kind of uh, rhetoric, but also, you know, it's it's two it's two-faced talk. So in order to get the message out, when there's all kinds of messaging going on, it takes really telling people that the, the state senate is very close right now. And if she goes back, that instruction to Congress will not happen. If that, if that in my opinion, if that senate stays Republican, uh, New Hampshire will be watching all the other states doing what we should be doing. And, the, you know, the, and I mentioned Benjamin Franklin. We were the first state, I believe, to adopt the Constitution. We've been first in so many ways, President Obama. Why do we want to be one of the last states to tell the Congress to clean up its act? Well, um, I love all the points that you've made, and I think they're all really important. And I don't think there's anybody on either side, like you say, who would disagree that campaign finance reform is, is critical. But our campaigns are driven by fear of electability. And they're driven by fear that the other guy has more money than you. And obviously having signing on to say, you know, New Hampshire is going to support this is really critical. And we can have forums and we can write letters to the editor. But we do need candidates who are going to stand up and include that in their platform. When you're making calls and knocking on doors and you're talking about issues, in the back of their minds, everybody knows that this is the root of the evil. But what they're concerned about is the job and the education and the lack of health care and the lack of services that are being provided. So how do we make this the topic? Um, let me answer it this way. In 2012, uh, when I did think about running for, for governor, and one of my topics was going to be what I'm talking about tonight in the state. And I didn't do it because I feel this is enough, this should be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. So my answer to that question is, the reason I'm here tonight is I've been at least on 30 speaking engagements, and I'd say 20 of those have been a road race. And I've done that on purpose, because I want business people who keep on saying, you know, there's too much regulation. And I say, let me tell you something, you're right. There's too much regulation on small banks. But you know why there's too much regulation on small banks? Because these big banks that we've now made too big to fail are actually creating an environment where now these small banks have to merge to become bigger. In other words, regulation is important. And w without regulation, you end up things like FRM. Here's something I want to tell you. In the, in the history of the state, the two largest Ponzi schemes happened within one year of each other. Now, that's not coincidence. And I can tell you tonight that, in my book, if you want to read it, um, I would say to you that everything that I saw which caused FRM in this other Ponzi scheme, nothing has been changed, meaning consumer protection laws haven't been changed. Right now, if you start a real estate uh, mortgage firm, you don't have to have any regulations commercial mortgages. And the list goes down. And the answer I have is what I'm doing. We need to get out and talk in forums and get people aware of this. And I, I'm guessing this year, because there's so much going on, 
uh, to Senator, to, to uh, former Senator Rubin's credit, he tried to make this an issue. But I think from my, from what I hear, I see the people involved in the Hampshire Rebellion, people are interested. And uh, when they see the amount of money spent in this election, and they see the result of some of the election results we're going to have, and what that means, and we saw that in 2010 uh, with, with the House that in my lifetime represented nothing that I'm aware of. We can get that back if people don't do what you're talking about tonight. And this is a good crowd. This is a good number. So, you, so we heard earlier, you have to get out and tell people what this state senate wouldn't do. And it's embarrassing to all of us that our state senate wouldn't be part of the movement to say our, our system's corrupt and we, we, don't, we don't tolerate corruption in our country. The Republican candidate for the legislature from the town of Hampton is an advocate for state owned public banking. Can you address I'm, I'm sorry, public state owned public banking where a public bank organized is organized as a utility to supposedly help ensure fiscal responsibility and available to make sure available credit is fair to the state level. <laughs> Um, I really know what that means. Let me say this. Let me give you my short answer to that. We've created a system that's too big to fail. What I want is a system that's too small to, to, um, so too small to say, meaning um, we need to cut down the, the size of the banks. And uh, the problem isn't the capital system. The problem is that our system, and I didn't make this point, I'm trying to make it tonight. The, the banks have become so much bigger that any one of these 12 banks I mentioned, if they fail, there goes the world economy. So if we went through that show once before, why do we want to redo? So I'm not an advocate to nationalize banks or to uh, uh, to make banks other than what they should be, which should be capitalized correctly, not these thinly leveraged banks, 30 to 1, which is what basically Lehman Brothers was. And that when the government provides liquidity to these banks, they actually put it out the loans. We we really need to do a better job. We can sit and argue about TAR and the way we capitalize these banks. But I think the reason why people today are so angry, when you think back what happened and how it affected their lives personally, the way we cut the budgets, state state governments and, and municipal governments state are still feeling the effects of all the cutbacks in 2008-9. It's because we didn't do the work on the front end. So uh, I, I really think that the, the, the answer to the question is very correct, which is in order to have a system that serves us as, as citizens, we need to rein in the elites. And the elites right now are bigger than they ever were. And I'm talking about we have these banks that are, I, when I say that to people, isn't it hard to believe that these banks are bigger now than they were then and the derivatives market's bigger? What's really changed? Today's Bell and News has Vermont talking about um, lessening Dodd-Frank regulations on local banks, on state banks, smaller banks. Um, I, I'm a huge proponent of local banks, and one thing I've said throughout my campaign is you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You keep asking for money, I'm not giving you money. Show me what you're doing. But, um, my point was, going forward, we have the power of our purse. That's all we've got left other than the power of our vote. And by who in this room is still banking with Bank of America? Who here is still banking with Wells Fargo? You know, we may be paying a couple, you know, points more in interest rate, but we're voting with our, putting our dollars behind us, you know, for supporting our local banks rather than supporting the big ones. Let me make a point about that. What was the big, biggest event of the summer? I think it was the Moolahs, right? So and yeah. it was... Market basket. Excuse me, market basket. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but, Think about this for a minute. Go back to the Arab Spring and all that. It's the social media. People are become more aware. They vote with their pocketbook. And that's important. And small community banks are vitally important. So I mean, it's the kind of decisions we have to make in our individual lives that will really have effect. You touched on consumer protection a bit though. Banging my head against that car phone for the last decade anyway. The banking department won't step up and do anything about it. 
AG's office won't step up and do anything about it. Consumers in New Hampshire, especially those that are dealing with mortgages uh, and, and things of financial nature, they aren't even good enough to be on their own because they don't have a prior right of action of the 350A. How would you suggest we go about changing that? Because John Hunt specifically, as far as I know, is one of the biggest speed bumps in changing and getting rid of that car. I've spoken to him several times. He doesn't want to budge. He was one of the original creators of that car. What do you suggest to change that? You're like the only person ever can ask that question. What he's talking about is, um, I think back in 2002 or 2003, the legislature basically said on the consumer protection law of the state that if a state agency, an enumerated uh, banking insurance, I think it did securities, and I tried to get that removed. If, that, if the agency didn't take action on the consumer protection law, that's where it ended. So to bring it back to FRM, we now know there were 70 violations of federal and state law that the, the banking department knew about. There are maybe, and I, I, I really don't know the answers, but the last count I was like 30 complaints rolled through the banking department and the attorney general's office, some of criminal nature. But the answer is, if the agency's not going to do anything, that's where the law ends, and that's where they want it. So what I've been advocating is, if this agency doesn't take action, it doesn't remove the citizen's right to take action under the consumer protection laws. That needs to go back to where it was before the legislature made that change. Oh, it absolutely needs to go back to where it was. And one of my criticisms of that, if I may, is the Attorney General's office. I mentioned this in my book. After FRM, they pointed this out. But the two mistakes they made about that was criminal jurisdiction is only the Attorney General's office. That statute doesn't uh, circumvent that. And also, they've been absent from the debate that some of us, like myself, have been making for the last decade. 358 AD needs to change. And the other thing that needs to change in that statute, believe it or not, and I kid you not, that when the banking department said, this is a securities issue, FRM, and I said, well, we don't regulate it. I don't have any papers. Let me see your papers. They wouldn't give me the papers, so I had a subpoena of records. And they wouldn't give me the records even when I tried to subpoena them. So the way the law works today is the banking commission, whoever he or she is, can decide not to release any records, and that is fine in the state statute. No other department in the state has that kind of authority. And it makes no sense. So it goes back to my whole uh, point earlier that what I, the wake up call to me as a private sector guy was. When I, for example, tried to propose legislation that said, if you want, if you were a shareholder of a state corporation and you wanted to communicate with your other shareholders, the way the law read when I was there, you had to go to Superior Court. The average person not going to do that. We tried to change the law that said that it would come to the Bureau and we could decide if you had the right to that record. And then if you didn't agree with this, then you go to Superior Court. Lobbies killed that too. The point is, when it gets to financial regulation of the state, the system, unfortunately, is more rigged than it should be, and that's an example of it. Margaret, it's just such an honor to have you here, and Jackie and I served on the um, Senate Commerce Committee that had oversight of a lot of you know, the great work that you tried to do during the whole FRM debacle. But I just, you know, wanted to sort of echo what Mark's talking about because one of the things that we legislated out of existence. In 2006 and 2008, was predatory lending. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, a lot of the <coughs> loan sharks you, you see throughout the state were you know, lending out to uh, loan from people at 50% interest. And I want people to be aware that the current senator, Forrester, as soon as she was elected, uh, they, they reauthorized that. So now in the town of Plymouth, New Hampshire, Okay, in New Hampshire, for the first time, we have a title loan company on the 25, and that's another example of, of how you know, things can change from session to session. So, thank you so much for all of you. Well, thank you. That's a good example. We have credit towards coming back again because of the 2010 election. Well, thank you very much, all hands.